Fidibo doctrine, we like to talk about doctrines, those ideas of man that men take out of the Bible, as it were, take it from Scripture, and try to make and say that the Bible says, and then it'll state some doctrine. And the doctrine is the idea that it is a summation or a topic of a scriptural truth. Now, the scriptural truth should be able to be stated by itself, and it should have its own name for it. I personally, in integral specificity, a theological premise that states that you can study and apply the scriptures as they are, the way they are, where they are, and take your leading from that, because the Holy Spirit then inspires you and conspires in your heart to agree with the Word of God, that I don't personally hold to this idea of making doctrines in order to understand the Bible, but rather to read the Bible and understand it as it's written. So, humorously, I have to deal with, lots of times, in video doctrine, false doctrines, false ideas that people have that they say comes from the Bible. Lately, in America, especially during this political season, I've had to deal with this unbelievable topic of a pastor of politics. And that's what I called this tape because, really, it aggravates me to no end. I would love to be the political junkie that I was before I got saved. You know, a protester, a contester, someone who likes to argue and debate, someone who likes to fight, you know, and to get what is right, you know, and to exercise my freedoms and my privileges and to go out and convince everyone to come along and jump on my bandwagon because, after all, I need their vote, don't I? And sadly, we see that when pastors take the privilege and the honor, the anointing that they've been given by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God Himself, and use it for political reasons, they literally whoremonger the Word of God into something God never intended it to be. Because you see, God can direct a man's heart any way he chooses. Proverbs teaches us that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it whatsoever way he chooses. We are told that God has put the magistrates in office specifically for our benefit, not for our content, and not for our judgment. You see, that's why we are not of this world, but we are in the world, but not of it. And so whenever I hear of, or I see, or I come into contact with this doctrine of politics that Christians get involved in, where they think they have to make Christianity a social event, where they need to promote and prosper themselves, or I would say to, quite frankly, well, you know, let's just put the rubber where the meets the road, you know, and call it what it is. You know, it's um, prostituting the gospel for the sake of politics. Now, I don't want to be condemning of a particular pastor, but I do see this happening in a lot of pastors. But in particular, one came across my attention and I focused in on and I dealt with and I prayed about and I challenged and shared the word with. and. The venue that I come from is a Calvary Chapel background where certain general themes are true in Calvary Chapels. And one of the most important one of them being the Word of God. You know, is that the Word is taught more than worship. Worship is always an important part of a Calvary Chapel, and there's always a time of setting up for the study of the Word of God by worship and turning the attention and the focus of our attitudes back towards God so that the Spirit of God could work in our hearts and the pastor could present the Word of God as he's reading through it from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, from line upon line, precept upon precept, from chapter to chapter, book to book. But sadly, unfortunately, when you see the end of a movement or you see a change going on in something you know to be true, sometimes things aren't always what they used to be. And well, initially, that's what most Calvary chapels were. Not all are the same. Sometimes you'll find that every Calvary chapel has its own particular, you know, kind of focus in on and vent, you know. And in some ways, there's a certain amount of oversight, you know, within the Calvary chapel movement itself to, you know, kind of manage a little bit to make sure that, you know, doctrinally, you know, some of the smaller Calvary chapels don't get off target or off focus. And 
to some degree, that works. But sometimes, I know because of my personal experience in going to lots of Calvary chapels, it doesn't always work that way. And sadly, sometimes, especially in an occasion where people disagree with the current administration, they get into politics more than they get into the Word of God. And so, you need to be careful of what you do, because what you are is your testimony to Jesus. This is your life. You get to choose to do with it as you want. And the people at one point in time in the Old Testament did what they chose to do, which was anything that they thought was right in their own eyes. You see, they didn't consult the Word of God, nor did they consult the prophets or teachers in that day, but they chose to do what was right in their own eyes, and God judged them for it. They reaped what they sowed, and Jesus said it, that God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. So, whenever we look at the doctrine of politics, whenever we look at we the people, or we look at democracy as it stands right now, we really have to be careful that we're dealing with subject matter as opposed to object matter. You see, the object matter that we are focused in on is an eternal kingdom. We are looking for eternal reward. We are looking for eternal life. We are looking for things that last longer than four years or one administration or eight years or a particular social party, whether Republican, Democrat, Independent, or whatever it may be. We don't look at joining and being a part of parties that divide. We look at the unity of the body of believers and we say to them, look, what you build upon your faith and foundation is your own choice. You can build your house upon sand or you can build it upon a rock. And the rock foundation that we talk about being built upon are the sayings that Jesus said. And he said on Matthew that, you know, these sayings of mine, if you do them, you will be like a man who's built his house upon a rock. That when the storms of life come, they'll stand. But if you don't do what I tell you to do, if you choose to go your own way and do what's right in your own eyes, then you'll be like a man who built his house upon sand. And when the storms of life come, how great is the destruction thereof. And sadly, I know, having seen what men have sown and reaped the whirlwind, the destruction that often comes upon ministries as well as ministers and even pastors and some that are in the Calvary Chapel movement, Whoa, wow, how great there is there of destruction. Lots of times, though, God protects a lot of people because of the prayers that are offered up for all the pastors that are in Calvary chapels, as well as all the pastors that are in all different kinds of ministries everywhere. Every minister is really prayed for by somebody somewhere at some point in time. And by the grace of God, they exist and do their job as best they understand, although at times they may be caught up in the ways of man and not the ways of God. And so we pray for them and we always hold them up but God also holds them to a higher standard. He doesn't let them get away with what they want to do. Our prime example of that is David. You see, David was a king in Israel, and David was given all the spiritual blessings that God could possibly give him except to build the house of God. David being a man of war and violence, you know, and being very violent, also had blood on his hands that God forbid him to build the house of God. Think about that on some other topic sometime you may not want to necessarily go in that direction. But David also was a man after God's own heart that he cared to know and to do God's will. Even though he was a violent man, even though he violence was his nature, he chose to observe what God was doing and wanted to be like God, wanted to know God, wanted to love God and follow after God's heart. And so when God confronted him, God always found in David a man after his own heart. But David at some point in time, decided that you know, he, he's king, he can do what he wants, he can do his own thing, so he did. He chose to disobey the commandments that God had already given him. And he decided to commit murder and adultery in the sight of God and the people. And he tried to hide it and cover it up. He tried to play politician. He tried to use his political force to accomplish his own will, choosing to do what he wanted to, rather than to listen to what God wanted him to do that day. And so he looked like he got away with it for a while. For a season he seemed to exist and go on. But Israel wasn't winning the wars then. Israel wasn't accomplishing its purposes. Israel was beginning to have less of an effect on the world that God had said it would be a light to the nations. Then the prophet came and confronted David. 
the prophet didn't tell David his sin. The prophet gave him a story and said, what should we do with this man that has done so great a sin in the sight of God and all the nation? And David said, stone him. And he says, you are the man. You see, according to David's own mouth, he condemned himself. But according to God's grace, he saved him. Because God knew David's heart. David at that moment admitted and fell to his face and fell to his knees and said, I am the man. And he knew he was guilty. And he knew he needed judgment. He knew he was responsible to the people for their spiritual condition, much less dealing with and delegating their spiritual reality of faith to the prophet and to the temple that was to be built and to God himself and to set an example. He was supposed to be that example, but wasn't. He failed and fell. And so God said, you pick the judgment. Here's what you get to choose from. And so his child dies. A lot of children of Israel die at the same time, by the way, if you read very carefully that story. So there was consequences to the nation as well as to David. And specifically, unfortunately, the consequences continued on beyond his lifetime, even in his own household, and split the nation. What a tragic mistake to follow politics and thinking you can do what is right in your own eyes. And so we're meant to learn from these things about politics. We see different people at different times and positions of authority failing and falling because they're put in such great authority that they sometimes get carried away with it. Sometimes that happens when men of God also turn their back on God and fail to do what they are called to do. I think of particularly when Samuel was called into the ministry. Unfortunate, Eli was high priest at the time, and Eli didn't raise his children the way they should have gone. But rather, God chose Samuel to be a prophet after his choice, and not Eli's children who rebelled and wound up perishing. Men of God ought to raise up underneath themselves children of God that would be likened unto Jesus himself, that they would go after those things that were pure and holy in the sight of God, not to go after the ways of man. We are told to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now, interesting is that the kingdom of God is not the kingdom of man. Behold, it says in heaven in the Revelation that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. So the day is coming when all the kingdoms of the world, all the nations of the world are turned over to God himself. And he holds them in the palm of his hand. But until that time, we're not told to be a part of those kingdoms because they are of the God of this world who has blinded the men and women who do not seek to follow after God Almighty, but who have been deceived into following the world and its ways. And so we see in democracy people saying, oh, well, it's a Christian democracy. We the people, a Christian democracy. Now, Scripture nowhere does it say that God chose to promote and to state a democracy of the people, by the people, for the people, was the greatest thing that there ever was, and that we should all jump on the bandwagon and say, hey, let's vote. But rather, God said, I can change a man's heart anytime I want to. But I want you to do something with me. I want you to do something for me. I want you to change a man's heart by changing his spirit to become born again. Not of the flesh, which obviously political systems are, because political systems are all fleshy endeavors of man trying to govern himself in a way that he thinks is right in his own eyes, but rather we who are born again need to be changed of the spirit that we become part of that spiritual kingdom that is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. For the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. It's not of this world. It's not to be seen, Jesus said, but it is all around us. It is all about us. It is that place that God has said that we are already in and he rules and reigns as king over all. And so, when I find in my mind that a pastor has sold his soul, so to speak, and his passions and his interests into politics, I find him very much deceived and chained like Joseph being dragged off into Egypt. Oh sure, he served Pharaoh and he served others, but he did not yet accomplish that which God wanted him to do until the time that God exalted him and pulled him out of the dungeon 
and removed from him the blinders off his own eyes, so that he could save his brethren. Likewise, so too, men of God need to focus in on what God has called them to do. Pastors often forget that because they have no one that will come to them and say, Hey, you know, I see that you're you know, kind of caught up in this worldly thing. You know, you're kind of doing the world in its ways. You're kind of like you know, acting wrong. Oh, they'll get lots of critics from the people saying, You're off. You're weird. You're a false teacher, you know. But that's not what God does. God didn't do that with David, and God doesn't do it with this man of God that I know that is in a Calvary Chapel that's really completely off. I mean, even his messages are all polit political. I mean, my gosh, you know. When you use the pulpit itself for politics itself, you know you're wrong, and there's no anointing, and the people will walk away from you, even as they did with Jesus at some point in time when Jesus said things that they didn't want to hear. When you choose to survive the body of Christ over worldly ways versus spiritual ways, you need to figure out what testimony you're leaving behind you. Are you a pastor of politics? Or are you a pastor after God's own heart? Are you a man seeking to lead and to follow Jesus in all your ways, acknowledging Him? In other words, have you trusted God with all your heart? Because you see, politics is a lack of faith in God Himself. When a man can pray and ask God to lead the way, then they can choose to ask Him for anything at any point in time and any day that they want to. They can choose to follow the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength because they have asked Him what to do, where to go, and what to say. They have obeyed the voice of the Lord as the Spirit of God has worked in their lives because they have been prepared by the Word of God and by the Church, by the very man of God who should have been reading the Word of God, teaching the Word of God, and living the Word of God Himself, so that He would not be caught up in the politics of the day, even as Solomon had to make choices that seemed to be politically oriented, as opposed to those things that God said to do. But rather, you would find the more excellent way that Jesus said, which was to follow Him today. So, I see in the world, and of the people, by the people and for the people, Christians failing the test that God has presented before them in choosing you this day whom you'll serve. Most people will stand up and say, hey, I'm a Republican. No, you're not. You're a Christian. But you may vote with the Republican Party at some point in time. Oh, I'm a Democrat. Well, you may be, but you're a Christian. You may vote with the Democratic Party at some point in time. But you see, voting really involves making a decision that God has given you the freedom of choice to do on your own, in your own eyes, thinking what is right, or to pray and to ask God what he would have you to do today. Because if he would have you to vote for a Democrat or Republican or an Independent or to not vote, then you would know that it was God who said what to do. Because today, if you hear his voice, hard not your heart, it says provocation, it does not say that you should, oh, well, you know, God is far away and he cannot hear. God is so far that he cannot see. God is a deaf God and a mute God that he cannot speak that he will not give me the wisdom that I need because he hasn't said, or has he? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who breedeth up and give it to all men liberally. Am I living as a Christian in this world, in politics, or am I being influenced of politics to be political in the world? That's the choice you make every day. Because you don't want to be a ministry of politics. You don't want to be a minister of political systems. You don't want to be a pastor of politics. Rather, you want to be a man of God, after God's own heart. So choose in your doctrine very carefully what you think is socially needful, and take it to God in prayer, and find out that the power of God rests in prayer, not in performing acts of voting where you think that for a temporary solution you're going to put a band-aid on a wound that you don't even know what the root cause is. Often people tell me why they vote, and I just ask them one question. Did God tell you to? And more often than not, almost to a man, most Christians will tell me no, if they're honest. Most of the time they won't even talk about whether they prayed or not, because they'll talk about, well, the issue is obvious, so I didn't pray. This is obvious, so I didn't have to. I didn't need to ask God. If any man lack wisdom, oh, but I have wisdom, really. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In other words, no, you don't have wisdom. 
Because the scripture is true and every man that be the Bible says that that every man be found a liar and God be found true. So the scripture is true in that it says you don't have wisdom because man looks on the outward things, the politics of it, but God looks on the heart. God has a will in politics, but you have to learn to walk your way through it in order to find him in it so that you don't do it according to the political way, but you do it according to the spirit of God in the way that he chooses to do today and not your own way or figuring out what is right in your own eyes. The pastor of politics fails in all of scripture. He always chooses the wrong side and doesn't know what the issues are because he's taken his eyes off of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he's found that he wants all these other things instead. You decide. You are the one whom God is inspiring today. You choose what you want to do with your doctrines today. Do you want to open your heart and follow Jesus in a simple way? Or do you want to get complicated and theological? Do you want to make it intellectual and religious? Do you want to be a religion of politics? Or do you want to make politics and religion subservient to your faith in Jesus Christ our Lord? If Jesus is your Lord, you'll ask him today, Whom shall I follow and whom shall I obey? Is it the way of man and politics? Or is it the will of God and not my will be done? I pray you choose this day whom you'll serve. But as for me and my house, we've already chosen and are serving the living God.